people are plugging in and they're getting ready even though we got nobody up there that's letting them know the service is going to start. in there. Can you move to the right? It's good. Yeah. It works with the light.
Good morning, good morning, Empowered Life Church. How's everybody doing today? Yes, we are. Amen, amen. I'm going to ask everyone to come in. Let's get ready for our, our second service, amen? Amen. 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 Are we woke this morning? Amen. Let's get excited about the things that God has done already, amen? And what he's going to do. Amen. If I can have you stand to your feet. As we get ready to go over our 2019 confessions. Amen. 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 Let's just start by giving the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's give him the highest praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if you look to the screen, you will find these words recorded. Amen. And repeat after me. I am empowered. I am empowered. I am transformed. I am transformed. Into the disciple. Into the disciple. God has called me to be. God has called me to be. My faith is stable. My faith is stable. Because my God is able. Because God is able. I leave the loss. I leave the loss. At any cost. At any cost. No matter the price. No matter the price. I, I will, will follow, follow Christ. Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Nothing shall be impossible Your kingdom reigns 
As the prayer team comes forward, I want you to think about something. And there's two songs, the, the second song and the last song we sang. And at the heart of it really is that, that God got you. He's going to come after you, but sometimes you're, you're not feeling well, things aren't going right in your life. And you, and you say, does God really know where I'm at? The answer is he does. He says in his word that every hair your head is numbered. I think that's pretty accurate. I know some of mine are out of order right now. I'm calling them back in Jesus' name. But God's got you. So what we want to do is the prayer team up here. There is such an anointing coming from, and, and, and the, the vision that I got is, is from Revelation 22. The water leaves the throne room of God, and it flows out towards the nations. But then there's trees, there's 12 trees planted, and the, the leaves of those trees, they bloom all year round, and the leaves of those trees are for the healing of the nation. You have to come forward for the anointing. Not that you can't get it on your own, but if you need something today, I want you to come forward for, for prayer. Because God wants to touch you today. Because he says, I'm going to chase after you. But there's also moments like the prodigal son, if you don't come forward, that's on you. Don't blame God. Because he's given you opportunities and more opportunities to have things change in your life. And there's nothing impossible for God. And sometimes we, we live in this world and, and it's tangible. If we can't touch it, we don't want to believe it. But God says, that's not who I am. I created everything. Like this, what the first song said, we're the sand. He created us out of dirt. And he made you a living, breathing individual. And God wants to touch you today. Whatever your issue, it's not necessarily just you're not feeling well. Something's going on in your life. You need a job. You're just not where you need to be with Jesus. You might need. You might have a family member that's sick. You know, you can come up and you get prayer for them. You can stand in the gap. Amen. And say, I just need you to pray. I don't know what's going on in my life, but something's not right. Amen. And some of you out there, and I told my wife this today. When the Lord tells you something, you just need to be obedient. So maybe you need to come up to that. God's giving somebody a dream and a vision of what the future's going to look like, and you're scared. God's not giving you a spirit of fear, of love, power, and a sound mind. That means there's things that you need to step into, but you might need an anointing, an extra anointing to get you over to that next step, to be encouraged by the Lord. But come on up.
worship God. Because it is all about Him. It's not about us. Text it, it's up on the screen. I'll give you instructions if you type text it into your phone. Mr. Curtis. I had the pleasure of hearing Mr. Curtis give the offering today. I already got a big fan base. <laughs> I love All right. 
Um, morning, church. Good morning. Um, for the uh, offering today, um, I'm going to read from uh, Malachi 3, 7 to 10. Um, and throughout when I'm reading, uh, keep in mind there's two points that we're going to go over that God wants you to keep in mind. Uh, Malachi 3, 7. Ever since the times of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decree, and you have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, said the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But, ask, but you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithe and offering, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, and that's the second part. Say the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not open the floodgate of heaven and pour out some, so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So the first thing that you have to keep in mind is this. Return to me and I will return to you. And that's that one step that we all need to do, make. We want to step toward God for him to be able to actually start to step toward us and envelop us and take care of us. So it takes your faith in him for him to be able to accomplish what he needs to do in your life. In terms of blessing, in terms of tithe, in terms of taking care of your family and friend. Um, the second part is that it says test them. Your expectancy. When you tithe, have the expectancy that you will receive, you will be blessed. Your 90% will be blessed. Regardless of everything, that 100% is his. He's only asking for 10. And he will bless the 90 to um, meet what needs to be met in your life. And it's really walking toward God for him to accomplish what he needs to do in our lives, as well as expecting him to do what he says he does, he's going to do. And that's how we all be blessed. So um, let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you for this awesome, awesome time. Thank you, Lord, Father God, for this um, revelation that you impart into our lives, Lord, and allow us to walk toward you, for you to actually embrace us and take us into your hands and bless us, Lord, Father God. We pray that you bless our tithes and offerings and that you allow them to multiply and be fruitful just like your word said. And Lord, we pray that with expectancy and belief in that, Lord, your word is true and will manifest. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You may bring forth your blessings. So shut up. That's, that's, that's pretty much what they all mean. Yeah. Yes. I've been living longer, so you don't know nothing yet. Wait till you collect Social Security and you talk to me.
We have a lot going on this morning, and so um, we have nothing specific for announcement, but we have a great presentation here. So let's go to Love Time, go get some coffee, hug someone's neck, and we'll see you back in a bit. Amen. Thank you. 
as we come on in and grab our seats. Amen. Let's see. We, as you know, uh, every year we try, we, we actually, for the past five or six years, actually six or seven years, we've always done a fall outreach for our church that our church has been one of the primary uh, sponsors of. And so we couldn't do the uh, the the uh, the community dinner this year because they tore down the building uh, that we were doing it at. <laughs> they, <laughs> but we wouldn't go there. And so, but we're blessed and honored to be a part of Operation Christmas Child. And, and we've been talking about this for the past few weeks. And I'm, I'm excited about it. And so this morning, we're gonna have a, just a quick presentation about what we're doing. And as you know, um, our vision is, is to empower people, transform lives. And so when you take part in something that really affects people's lives for the gospel, that is our vision and, and our culture at Empower Life Church. And so as normal, we always have a high level of expectation that everyone who calls this church their home will be a part of the of, of this outreach of, uh, and also part of the process because you get blessed, they get blessed, and, and God gets glorified. So um, we have a real life, we have two real life people from the Bible. Um, uh, Esther, who, you know, and, and then and then Cynthia, who I didn't even know was in the Bible, which my wife told me. So uh, I'm, I'm illiterate, biblically, and I'm the pastor. So anyway, come on up, and they're going to share real quick, and um, our, yeah, so rock and roll. Good morning, Power Church. Thank you for having us here. We want to uh, thank Pastor Jerry and his family for inviting us here today. We are just going to show you a quick video about the journey of a box, which you guys will be part of this week, or not this week, but November 18th through the 25th. And we're so excited for this season right now because we're just getting, you know, a new church, a couple of new churches involved. And you guys are being the central drop off for a lot of local churches that have come here bring the boxes here to you guys we just and we're thankful for joseph and his wife to be the leader of this and they're so excited about that i have never seen a church so excited as they are they're so excited they ask questions make sure they're doing it right and everything and it's awesome to see and this is esther she is our regional coordinator she's coming from uh, riverside or not riverside uh california somewhere in our there. <laughs> she come from the corporation side, so she's going to share a little bit more about the shoebox. Okay, we're going to start with the video. <laughs>
Isn't it cool to see those kids' faces? We may not get to see them, but God sees those kids, man. I had an opportunity to be in Zimbabwe a couple of years ago, and that to see a shoebox, a carton, still there to give out to those children, it is what's so exciting because it's real. It was real that they went overseas, but it travels so many different forms of boats, planes, canoes, elephants that you saw. But we may not never get to see the joy of those kids, but the Lord did that. But you guys are a part of that. We thank you so much. Yes, just talk. I love how ELC, you know, you're united with the same goal of really empowering, empowering your church and your community and just really being part of the transformation and that can only come from Christ and that could only come from the gospel. And this year, as you pack each of these red and green boxes, I uh, wanted to just introduce it to you with its name. We call it lovingly at Operation Christian Child Go Box. It's not go because it's going somewhere, but it's actually short for gospel opportunities because we know that's the biggest thing that can transform lives. It's the gospel, and it's a platform. It's a platform where we're really equipping and empowering local churches all around the world to share the love of Christ. And they can do it because they can actually share uh, to each child they invite. So if a church is able to get 100 shoeboxes, they're inviting a hundred children that they pray for, they know by name, and they actually walk sometimes or uh, buy for hours uh, just to invite these children. And when they come, they come not knowing what they're gonna get. They're there and they hear the gospel and they're just amazed. Um, I, I had the opportunity to actually be in Uganda last year where a girl, as she's learning about this Jesus who died on the cross, I still have a photo of her in a beautiful red dress, just leaning in, just so shocked and just so sad just to see the picture of the cross. But of course, their story doesn't end there. It ends with the greatest victory of Jesus, right? Raising up from the dead. And with that, her and her friends are just overjoyed by that. And this is even before the shoe boxes open. And then, of course, uh, children, they open up their boxes and they are just amazed about just experiencing the love of God that they just heard about in a very tangible way. And I will say children all around the world, they're just like our kids. You know, they want to be loved. They need something tangible to really experience it. But just because they're little doesn't mean they have no opportunity to be the ones to ignite transformation in their community. And because of that, we know they're hungry. They want to learn more about this Jesus they learned about. So they come back. They go through the discipleship program, and when they graduate, they actually get a copy of their own, uh, they get their own copy of the Bible. Um, it's in their own language, and that's important because, you know, we're all, uh, we're all privileged to be called a child of God Amen. and to be able to enter the throne room of our God and come before him in his living word and to have that in their own language. And sometimes this is the first Bible ever in their family. For them to actually not just have it, but read it an average of three times within the six to two years after they graduate from the discipleship program, that's showing how much God is moving in these communities. Yeah. And this is an example of how from there, transformation is happening all around the world. And last year we were able to celebrate how 1,286 churches were planted in places where the gospel Hallelujah. had never been shared. And that's because Hallelujah. it's children who graduate from the discipleship program. The parents are seeing transformation in them and are curious and they come out. And the church can use this Bible to learn more about our awesome God. And from there, they get to have people around them notice. And we actually hear about people who may not even be believers, whether it's a village chief or even an Amman giving up anchors of land so that they could build the first church. So we're excited that you as a church, as you open up your doors this fall, to welcome in these gospel opportunities, not just from your church, but the churches around. And actually, you'll be the last ones to touch these boxes before they leave Southern Nevada. We are allowing and equipping and coming alongside our brothers and sisters in over 160 countries to be able to do what they can do best is to churches and get these children 
to come before the Lord and be leaders and history makers in their countries. And we will see the day when our Lord comes, we will be celebrating with them. Yes, we may not see them this year or this lifetime, but we know in heaven we will see those beautiful faces Hallelujah. and their stories with yeah. me because they got to hear about That's Christ good. in a form of a shoebox. So we're excited for you guys this year. We know we have Brother Jason going to share a little more about how you can get involved too. Good morning, Good morning. Uh, first, let's give another hand to Cynthia and Destiny. So, what we're doing with our first Christian time, we're taking time out, we're going to to all three of our services. So, thank you so much, guys. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Joseph, my queen, Darlene. She's stage, stage, but she doesn't want to come up. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, yes, we. Uh, very thankful for this opportunity, I'm actually honored for this opportunity to lead Operation Christmas Child. Personally, uh, years ago when I was back in Chicago, I would always, every year, pack shoeboxes from me and send them off, mail them off to their headquarters in California, I think it was at the time, that you would have to mail it to me. And it wasn't part of a church, it was just me wanting to give and help. And the blessing that you get from that, knowing that you pack the shoebox and you see the the video, you can see the excitement in those children when they get the boxes. It's just really a blessing. So they say a picture is worth a thousand words. So I want you to remember that video you just saw. Think about all those cars that you saw traveling all over the world. Now picture ELC as a central drop off. So you're gonna have people from all over Nevada bringing shoe boxes here. And if you can, try to picture those boxes stacked in here somewhere in the hall or whatever. And imagine one person trying to do that and take all those cards, log them in, do everything that needs to be done, take the two boxes, put them into the cards, seal them up, load them into a truck. So just, just imagine how much work and effort that takes for one person. So what I'm trying to say is we need everybody. We're a family. We want the whole ELC family to be a part because we don't want one person to have to try to do everything as is the case a lot of times when we have events, one person has to do 40 jobs. We don't want that, we want everyone. It's like, it's like nine different opportunities, uh, roles in this process. So we need people, so we need everybody to come out. Take a minute of your time. It doesn't have to be every night, but if you can come an hour this night, 20 minutes another night, whatever it is, it'll be well appreciated. It'll take a lot of load off of those who are trying to get this, jo this job done. So, and also remember that this is ministry. Don't look at it as work, it's actually ministry because we're sending boxes out and sending the word out all over the world. Amen. So this is actually ministry. Amen. So if you look at it from that perspective, and also back in when I was in school, we had this thing called cliff notes that we would use to cheat instead of reading books. <laughs> uh, so the cliff note version of the Bible is love him, love them. That's the cliff note version of the Bible. Amen. So love. That's good those children out there that need these boxes. Show love to them. Show love of God to them. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. So as my wife comes up to prepare what I want to let you all know, as your senior pastor, I love my job. I love I love my, my uh, not a, I don't call this a job. I call this a blessing because I love what I do. And so right now on, you can go on the planning center. You should have gotten a tip today. I'll send another one out tomorrow. But uh, we have, if my numbers are correct, 138 adults in this church. Adults, about 72 to, to 82 um, people who are in high school or younger. So what I want is I'd like to see 138 names registered on Planning Center in the next week or so, amen? amen. So right now we have 17 registered. That's a long way from 138. So, and, and you know I will call you and ask you why you signed up. Y'all know me, right? 
Right. Okay, yeah. praise God. And I'll do it in love. Either I'll call you TJ or one of the two, but hey, some, some black man's gonna call y'all to figure out where y'all at. All right? So anyway, oh, are you okay, baby? You all right? Oh, you good, all right. Love you, have fun. What? So you can participate in taking boxes and filling up those shoe boxes as well. So there's many opportunities for you to serve in this capacity. She didn't mention like they need toothbrushes, just simple things that we take for granted are blessings for them. She said some places they have to share. Who wants to share a toothbrush? We can all buy a toothbrush. You know? <laughs> she was a liar. Nasty. <laughs> um, anyway, there are a lot of things without a toothbrush. Okay, so <laughs> here. So there are opportunities for you to serve. You want to participate in this. Amen? We'll all be here. I don't know what we'll be doing, but we're going to get told and we're going to all just all pitch in. They say many hands make the low light. So if we get many hands, it'll make the low light for everybody. Amen? Amen? So let's come out and serve the Lord in this capacity, right? Amen. 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 So we are getting ready to go back into Matthew. We have been going through Matthew for months now. It's still going to be a bunch of months. We go through, we're only on chapter 11. Hopefully you guys are it's getting more interested in God and his word and it's becoming alive to you. Um, I love it because, you know, I love how there's so many stories in the Old Testament that, that pull in and if you understand that, how it all ties together and you get clear understanding of what God is trying to say to us and what can we learn from this. And then the biggest part is how can we apply it to our everyday lives? How can I live in that right now where I am in 2019 and even going into 2020? God is a living God who walks and talks with us. I love that God loves words, that he's a communicator, and that he likes to talk to us individually. What is he saying to us? What can I use this to, to fuel um, my world? Because we all have our own individual worlds that we live in. We live in a neighborhood. We work on jobs. We have a written family. We have different circle of influences. And how can I take this and apply it to this so that I can be effective in all the kingdom of God? Because I'm, I'm just represented on the earth. You know you're not, you're, you're just a germs, right? You're, twi you're tent dwellers. You're like Abraham. All you do is go from place to place because this is not your home. Church, this is not your home. I know we want to have 401k, have retirement, be able to die good and be able to travel. And I'm not saying God has a problem with that. The problem is that this is temporary. It is not permanent. And we're living for there, not just for here. Amen? Amen? Man, I'm like, okay, y'all a little quiet today. <laughs> so let us pray. Father, we thank you. We honor you. We give you glory in this place. You are the mighty God. You are our king. You are our master. You are our Lord. You are our savior. You are our maker. We exalt you in this place. We lift you high in this place. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that you've done for us. We thank you that you are the king on high. We lift our eyes to the hills for where our help comes from. My help comes from the Lord who makes heaven and earth. Father, we glorify you in this place. We magnify you. We're careful to give you the praise. We're careful to give you glory. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has for us today. Let my mouth, Lord God, speak the things that you want me to speak. Let me say what you want me to communicate to this group of people. Father, we ask you to us for us to go on a journey with you. Teach us how to be like you. Teach us how to hear from you. Teach us how to see you like we never saw you before. Teach us to feel you like we've never felt you before. So, Father, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen. 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 We give you glory, God. Oh, we serve an awesome God. Amen. Awesome God can take a shoebox and witness to people. Yeah. Out of, I mean, you think about that. I think you said, what, 11? How many boxes did you guys give out last year? Almost 11 million. 11 million boxes last year. That's what they're believing for this year. 11 million boxes. I mean, that's, I mean, I mean, I know we're going, I think I'll get 11 million boxes went out last year. So we just thank you. So let's read. Matthew 11, 20. We're only covering four verses. And yes, I'm going to talk for about an hour on four verses. <laughs> just get ready. <laughs> 11, 20. Then he began to censor and reproach the cities in which most of his mighty works had been performed because they did not repent and their hearts were not changed. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have long, they would long ago have repented in sackcloth and ashes, and their hearts would have been changed. 
I tell you further, it should be more endurable in Tyre, in Sidon, on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, are you to be lifted up to heaven? You shall be brought down to Hades, to the region of the dead. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have continued until today. But I tell you, it shall be more endurable for the land of Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. I know it's kind of, kind of rough, right? What are we going to learn from this? I like the King James version in the first verse a little bit better because it says he began to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they had not repented. That word upbraid, I like it better. A lot of translations say rebuke. A lot of translations says to censor. But when you go into the Greek of the word, the word is actually the word upbraid, which means to find fault with someone or to scold. He was saying shame on you. He, was, he used rough and unpleasing methods. But they cannot be taken first until gentler ones have been used first. So that's the kind of thing. It's kind of like a child. You all, whoever have children, or if you've been a child, you know what it's like when your parents tell you to do something and you have not done it. At first, they may say gently, but if you keep on being obstinate, eventually they go, my mother say, get you behind. They're going to get you, right? Something like that. <laughs> I know I'm in church. I'm like, Lord, what's the great words? <laughs> My mama was not saved when I was a kid. <laughs> Burn it back. Because that is not what she said to me, but you get the point. <laughs> I remember what my mom said, like, oh, that does not translate well for church. <laughs> and I, all of a sudden, I remember my mom was not a Christian when I was growing up. My mom became a Christian when I was 16. <laughs> so I won't tell you some of the things that were said to me, but yeah, I digress. So <laughs> Christ is not quick to upbraid us. First, wisdom invites. So we invite, it's an advice. It's, so first, the invitation is, I need you to change or don't do that. You know, at first we said, don't do that. And eventually it's like, tap your hands. Why? Because what you can't hear, you'll feel. You, you get that? Get that in the spirit. What you can't hear, you will feel. These messages come out so differently, and I have no idea why. Okay, so, but her invitations are slighted. So she upbraids. So in other words, when you don't get it on this level, I have to up up another level so that you can understand what I'm about to say. This is how James put it. It says, if any of you is deficient in wisdom, let him ask of the giving God who gives everyone liberally, ungrudgingly, without reproach or fault finding. That same approach and fault finding is the same word of praise. So he does it. He'll give you wisdom liberally. He won't quickly upbraid you. So he's not just quick to get on us. I know we, we come, some of us came from you know, ideologies where God is going to get you if you do one thing wrong and ah, he's going to zing you and zap you and you're going to die immediately. I grew up in church like that. I grew up under holiness. You know, you had to wear pants. You couldn't wear no makeup. You couldn't wear pants. You, had to wear make you couldn't wear makeup. You know, my sleeves couldn't be any shorter than this. You know, it was holiness or hell. That's how I grew up. And I thank God for my days for that. I really do. Because I understood to fear God. Unfortunately, he taught us to be afraid of God, and there is a big difference. We still need to fear God. He still is lifted high up on the throne. We can't get too common with God and forget that he is God. Amen. I know we say, I'm a friend of God, and I love the song. We sang it a hundred times. I'm a friend of God, and I'm a Israel song, and we are friends of God. But it's just like our children. We can be friends after you understand that I'm your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Right now, we're not so friendly terms. They're teenagers, and right now, you know, my mother, when I was a teenager, my mother, she put on the side of the door, she says, teenagers, why well, you still know everything? Move out and pay your own bills. She actually put a sign on, my refri on the refrigerator that said that. Teenagers, why well, you still know everything? Move out. So what was the point? The point of the matter is that she was still the mama, and I wasn't running anything. He's still God, and you were not running anything. We would do well to remember that. He is a loving and he is a gracious God. He is, but he does expect obedience of his children. He expects that if he, you know, it's like he expects if he does all of this for you, that you're going to give him the glory, you're going to give him the praise, you're going to give him the honor. There is an expectation that there was an exchange. When he exchanged with you, see, this is the problem. We say, oh, I'm a Christian, but your life now is not your own. So you can't go where you want to go. I know you think that you're American. You can't. You can't go where you want to go. And you can't say what you want to say. 
You can't do what you want to do. Why? Because you were bought for with the price. That's what that word redeemed is. He bought you. He purchased you. So now you belong to him. You're a dead man. Yes, you walk around the flesh, but you're supposed to be dead, which means, no, you can't cuss somebody out. It doesn't reflect the kingdom. Amen. Like I tell my kids, you are a camper. So what does that mean? You have to act the way this family tells you to act. Amen. You're a Christian. You have to act the way our Father asked us to act. Amen. Amen. Then Jesus began to denounce the towns in which most of the miracles were formed. So most of where his mighty miracles were done were in Capernaum. In Capernaum, you guys remember? He cured the satyrian service. He healed um, Peter's mother-in-law from fever. He healed the sick man from the palsy. Jairus' daughter was raised from the dead. The woman with the issue of blood was healed. He cast out the devil out of, of the dumb man. He um, opened the blind man eyes of two men. Um, you can just keep on going. There's so many miracles that happen in Capernaum. Remember I said Capernaum is where Jesus lives. So when Jesus go, go see Capernaum, Jesus went home. So this is where Jesus lived. Do you guys remember? Jesus had the house where the man pulled off the roof. So people had access to God like never before. He was walking the streets with them. They could be walking by. There's, there's, a, there's a, the living God walking next to me. But the sad part is he was walking amongst them and they didn't know it. They treated the presence of God as common. But we do the same thing. He came and lived on the inside of us. And sometimes we treat him as common. Of no consequence. It's only convenience. I, when I need him to do something, he's more like a life insurance policy. I'll, I'll check in on the policy when I need him, but other than that, I'm good. You understand what I'm saying? We can't treat the presence of God as common, like, it's no big deal. No, he came and dwelt among us. He lives inside of us now. So now he's dwelt among us. Now he lives inside of us. How much more? So everybody in here has, a, if you're a believer in here in this place, you have the indwelling of the presence of God in you bodily. Amen. Don't we believe that? Yeah, the Holy Spirit, you can't get saved without him. He comes, he makes his home in the inside of you. You are now the temple of the Holy Ghost, right? Yep. But how many times do we treat that presence as common? We take it into places that we shouldn't take it into. We see things we shouldn't see. We do things we shouldn't do. You're treating the presence of God just like these people of no consequence in common. Where am I? So great privilege brings great responsibility. No city, cities were ever more privileged as these three cities. The Son of God, like I said, walked their streets. He performed his mighty works. In the face of overwhelming evidence, they still stubbornly refused to repent. But you know what I thought? You know, sometimes we stubbornly refuse to repent. That's just the way I am. God's like, no, change your ways. <laughs> That's the way my mom and them do it. I don't care. <laughs> Change your ways. You know what I mean? You get people, I'm just Italian. I'm, I'm Irish. No. We're Christians. Amen. First. Right. I know that's not popular. Your culture has to submit to the culture of the king. I don't know where I'm going there. Your culture has to submit to the culture of the king. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth. It is his kingdom. So we operate in the realms of the kingdom, not on the realms of who we were born by or what race we are, what culture we are, how our family does it. Amen? Amen. Amen. I don't know how I get on this stuff. Let's go to verse 21. <laughs> whoa. Jerusalem, whoa, but say that. So the word woe is ui, uai, uai. And it means grief. He wasn't pronouncing judgment as he was grieved over their behavior. Sad and miserable, terrible. Con he was saying terrible calamity is going to come upon you if you do not repent. So the same thing with the child. Eventually, you keep on doing that, you're going to find yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. This is not a final judgment, but it is a delay. There's still time to repent, but if you don't repent, oh, you're going to get it. That's basically what he's saying. He's giving them a chance. So you can know for certain um, because Jesus will be the final judge, and he said so. He could have just cursed them like he cursed the tree, and they could have withered and died right then. Right? But that's not what he did. So it's a deep and painful feeling of distress caused by bereavement or suffering, or it's an exhalation of pity. He was being sorry for them. His motivation is love. That's how we have to be motivated as Christians. When we have compassion on people where they are, we love them. It's our compassion that drives us, not our judgment. People, the world does not need our judgment. That's good. That's good. They need a 
our love. Yeah, that's good. They need our compassion. And it's the compassion, the bowels of compassion that says, baby, you don't have to live like this. You don't have to live. Your life doesn't have to look like this. There is a better way. I love you enough not to leave you the way that you are. There is a, there's a more tangible way for you to live. So it's not just, oh, just they're going to hell. They already know they're going to hell. They don't need you to tell them that. They need you to love them. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm over it. You know, the little signs. People, pe people don't, they don't need to hear that anymore. And I'm not saying that they need to hear such grace that you can do whatever you want to do and live any way you want to do. And Jesus is going to love you either. That pendulum cannot be from here to here. We have to live balanced. There's no balance in the church right now. It's either you're way over here and they're judgmental and they're sending everybody to hell. They're over here. It doesn't matter. Just do what you want to do, and God's going to love you. There's no judgment. Then why did Jesus die? Right. There's no purpose in him dying if sin is not a consequence. We got to have proper theology. Because some, some things, it sounds good, but it doesn't make good theology. And you better know your word. Let me say this. You better know your word in proper balance of theology in these days. Because there's the guiding spirits, and it sounds good, but it is not Bible. And even though it may be hard and we do not understand it, does not mean that we get to throw it out. I want to say that in caution because there's so many things we can't we can't understand it. You know, like I told you, if you can understand God perfectly, you don't have a God; you have an idol. Come on, He is God. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are beyond our ways. There are some things we may not understand because we only see like this, and He's looking at eternity. And so we're with our finite minds trying to explain and understand an infinite God, and it does not work. So if you don't understand it, we don't throw it out because it's the Word of God. He is the Word. Made flesh, wait, do we believe in John? The Word was God, the Word was with God, and became flesh and dwelt amongst us. He is the Word. So we don't get to throw away His Word. Heaven and Word will pass away, but His Word will stand. It is the Word that you need. So we don't throw out things of the word because they don't fit into our society of today. It doesn't make us comfortable of today. Yep. We stand on the principles of the word because they're truth. And truth will always prevail. So Jesus mentions Tyre and Sidon, comparing them to several cities in which he performed miracles. These cities of Israel have been blessed with Jesus' presence. These the three cities have been blessed with Jesus' presence, his power, his preaching, yet they had not repented. So Jesus pronounces woes on them, stating that Tyre and Sidon would be given the opportunity to and would have turned from their wickedness and been saved. So I want you guys to get that. When we, we're going to look at who these cities were, you think, these cities, if they would have seen everything that Jesus did, they would have turned and been saved. So Jesus used these pagan cities to highlight the way God has chosen, how God's chosen people have refused him. The Israelites of Jesus' day believed themselves to be righteously following God, yet they did not recognize God in their midst. In essence, um, in essence, um, they were they were they were they were making him ashamed. Because God's people were rejecting the people that were supposed to be looking for him. The people who said they were looking for the Messiah, that said they were righteous, that said that they had God and they knew who he was, didn't recognize him. Rejected him. You know why they rejected him? Because he didn't do it the way that they thought he was going to do it. Mm -hmm. How many times do we, we pray for something, but we didn't get it the way we wanted it. And so God did it a different way and we rejected and called it the devil. Mm -hmm. God, I want you to use me. God, I just, I want you to use me. Then storms come. Mm. That's the devil. No, that's God using you, baby. He's trying to make you go <laughs> down deeper. That's and if good. you don't have a storm, you won't have deep roots so that you'll be able to sustain. So he brings the testing so that you can be tried, so that you can be proven, so that you can be used. But you don't want the testing and you call it the devil. How many times do we blame God for something God is trying to test us to train us so that we can be fit to be used That's and good. we call it the devil. That's good. Instead of saying, okay, God, you don't waste any experience in my life and you're going to use it for your good. And all things are going to work out for the good of God. Who, who, for the good of God. I'm not thankful for everything. I'm thankful in everything. And there is a big difference. So Tyre City and Sodom were ancient cities with a long-standing reputation of wickedness. 
Um, so we're talking about these two ancient cities, and the biggest things about them is that they, they, they had human sacrifices to the god of Baal. Remember, they would throw their babies on the altar and kill them, all that stuff. These are these same people. In the Bible, from Genesis, you find these, these two cities all the way through. Um, I'm just going to mention them for people who like history, like I do. You may want to read these stories in Isaiah 23, 1. I'm just going to tell you what they are. Jeremiah 25 through 22, if taking notes. Jeremiah 25 through 27. Jeremiah 47 through 4. Ezekiel 26 through chapter 28. Joel 3, 4 through 8. And Amos 1, 9 through 10. And Zechariah 9, um, 3 through 4. All of these talk about the, the um, prophecies that are against these two nations because of their lifestyle. So these two Phoenician cities, and we're talking about Tyre and Sidon, were 25 miles from each other. Um, the ancient port city of Sedona is what now is where Lebanon is. So along the city of Tyre and Sidon, were, um, they were the most powerful um, city states. They, they were, be like London and New York. They were famous cities, very known. Um, Tyre was a manufacturer of purple during that time. Purple dyes were hard to come by, they were hard to produce, and they were known for being a, um, for, for purple production, which is why um, purple is used for royalty, because only they, could, they were the only people could afford it. Um, Sidon um, produced glass, they were a glass manufacturer, and they actually first started port cities, so people could come in by ships and they could send out their wares from the ports. So they were the first people to do this kind of thing, and back then that was huge, you know, to have port cities, people come in, if they need, take it back to where they, where they needed it to go. They were known for being cosmopolitan and progressive. Princess Jezebel, father, was the king of Sidon. You guys know who she is? She's the one who married King of Ahab, uniting both of those kingdoms. And so Jesus went there. We see that in Matthew 15, 2, Mark 7, 24. Apostle Paul went to both of these places in Acts 27 and 3. So he said that if they had seen what he did, they would have repented with sackcloth and ashes. And I know we, that's not familiar to us because we don't see people do this, so I'm going to explain to you kind of what they are. So sackcloth and ashes were used in the Old Testament. They were symbols of debasement, showing mourning and repentance. So someone wanting to show a heart um, of repentance would wear sackcloth. And they would sit and put ashes on their heads. I'm like, this must have been a sight. Have you guys ever cleaned out a fireplace? And have you seen the way ashes get? I mean, it, it, you look a hot mess, right? Okay. So sackcloth was a coarse material. It was usually made from um, the hair of a black goat. And it's, um, so it signified desolation and ruined. It's also a sign of mourning. But I thought they were willing to be uncomfortable and look stupid. Mm. That's good. That's what, you know, that's what I got out of it. I'm like, who wants to wear some gamble? Right. You know, like that's some rough, rough, you know, some rough stuff. But they were willing to be uncomfortable and didn't care what anybody thought about how they looked. That's what repentance does. I don't care what it looks like. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to change, Amen. right? Amen. So they would have repented, Jesus says, with expressions of deep sorrow. Like Nineveh, they would have seen their guilt in danger and they would have turned from their iniquities. So heathen cities would have received him better than the cities of his own native land. Matthew eleven three says, In you, Capernaum, you will be lifted up to the heavens and you will be brought down to Hades, the region of the dead. For if the works done in you had been done in Sodom, you guys remember Sodom and Gomorrah? It would have continued till today. But I tell you, it will be more endurable for you than the land of Sodom on the day of judgment. So Jesus addresses Capernaum. He says, you. <laughs> you know, you get your kids, you. <laughs> you. You get mad, you say, you. So you heard Christ's teachings personally. You saw his extraordinary miracles day by day. You were in residence with him, and few cities had had that. Its people should have repented gladly and acknowledged the Lord. But Capernaum missed its day of opportunity. They saw firsthand, yet stubbornly refused to repent of their sins and believe in him. This is what Isaiah 55, 6 says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. And let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. To our God, for he will abundantly pardon him. So the words that be more tolerable in the day of judgment indicates that there will be different degrees of punishment in hell, just as there are different rewards in heaven. The single sin that leads men to hell is their refusal to submit to Jesus, right? Or accept him as Lord. 
But the depth of suffering of hell is conditional upon the sins of the person who participated in how much they knew about what they weren't supposed to do. So the Jewish historian Josephus looks at these different factors that causes Sodom's demise. It was pride, homosexual behavior, and hatred. Now, we only pick out one, but it wasn't just one. That was a part of it. It wasn't the total thing. We make such a, you know, a big deal on one thing, and God was really talking about more than that. So let's look at Ezekiel 649. He said, Behold, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. I want you guys to listen to this and see if this parallels to our world. Pride, overabundance of food, prosperous ease, and idleness were hers and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. And they were haughty and committed abominable offenses before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw it and I saw fit. Pride, overabundance of food, prosperous ease, idleness. And they became hard hearted. They didn't love anymore. They didn't see people in need and want to help them anymore. That's what pride does. It causes you to be narcissistic and focus on yourself. And forget everybody else, you know, that's the way they got themselves in that position. You know? And that's that's stuff we say, right? I know it's hard. But we cannot not love because of what somebody got themselves in position of. If that's the case, what would, you, what would we do if Jesus had done that to us? They got themselves in this same matter. I'm going to die for them. Let them suffer in hell. That's, the, that's on them. We wouldn't like that too much, would we? Thank God he's merciful and gracious. But he gives us the love of God has been shed brought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who's given to us. Don't hold up your bowels of compassion when you see people in society. Amen. 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 Be compassionate just as Christ is compassionate to you. Amen. About this time, the Sodomites grew proud on the account of their riches and, riches and great wealth. They became unjust toward men and impious toward God, insomuch they did not call to mind the advantages they received from him. Everything we have is an advantage. They hated strangers, and they abused them with sodomitical practices. But had the sodomites been so privileged, it would have repented. So think about this. Jesus saying, had the sodomites seen what I did in Capernaum, they would have repented. You, I mean, think about that for a minute. This wicked, self-serving that we know about is... God destroyed with fire and brimstone would have repented and changed their ways that they seen what Jesus did. Mm. But Capernaum privilege was greater. Sodom's sin of perversion was great, but no sin is greater than Capernaum's rejection of a holy God. Therefore, Sodom will not be punished as severely as Capernaum in the day of judgment. Think about that. All of Sodom's sin, they will not be judged as harshly as Capernaum. What is the result? The destruction right now of Jerusalem, Bethsaida is so complete, their exact sites right now are unknown. And the location of, per, of Capernaum is not even positive. They don't know where these cities are. So Jesus' words came to pass, right? Yeah. <laughs> so what can we do to learn from these passages? Number one, don't be unresponsive. Not only does Jesus condemn the wicked, but the indifferent as well. There is a danger of being unrepentant. We cannot be indifferent. This is what Hebrews 12, 14 says. Strive to live at peace with everyone and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Exercise forethought and be on watch to look after one another. See that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing, in order that no root of resentment Rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoot forth and cause trouble and bitter torment and may become contaminated and defiled by it. That no one may become guilty of sexual vice and become profane, godless, and sacrilegious person as Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. But you understand that later on when he wanted to regain the title to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, disqualified, and set aside so that he could find no opportunity to repair by repentance. What had he done? No chance to recall the choice he had made. Mm. I know we say, no, God will restore 
you know, we say God will restore all of the people. And I'm not saying that God will not restore, but you never really get back time. Once it's gone, it's gone. I'm not saying that God won't even make it a blessing, but all of that along the way, you still got to deal with. Good. And I think people forget that. They just think, well, you know, I'm going to make it. Yes, but you took a long detour and took with a lot of pain and they did things to your soul that you now have to get over. And that's what people don't understand about sin. Sin affects your soul, what your mind, your will, and your emotions. So now you're battling things in your mind and your will and your emotions that you never had to go through, that God never wanted you to go through. Amen. And I'm not saying that he won't get you there. And people are so quick to say, oh, he'll just use it. He will eventually use it. But that wasn't his original plan. And do not think there's not a consequence to sin. There is. I don't want us to be so comfortable with sinning than getting God's grace and forgiveness when he has empowered you to not sin. Hallelujah. Draw on that. Use it for that. I'm not saying you can't, you know, grace he covers. Yes, but use it as a launching pad to keep you from doing that stuff. Hallelujah. Don't treat the presence of God as common. He is there to help you. The Bible says what? Well, he always makes a way of escape, which means his presence is there to say, don't do that. I hear him sometimes. Don't say that. Don't say that. Shut your mouth. Don't go there. You hear him? You're like, no, I'm going to say what I got to say today. You know what I mean? Come on, let's be real about it. You'll feel the Holy Spirit telling you that, but you'll be like, no, not today. I'm gonna, they're going to get a piece of my mind today. But you can't make excuses saying the Holy Spirit didn't tell you not to say that. Because he was there saying, you just, just hold it, hold your peace, he'll fight your battles. I'm like, okay, hold your peace, he'll fight your battles. Amen. Some of y'all need to sing it. This is how I fight my battles. Shut my mouth. That's how I fight. That's how, I fight. That's how you fight your battles. Because you can't get those words back. Once they're gone, they're gone. You can apologize, but it does not take away the sting that was already given. Amen. That someone else now has to get over because you told them what you thought. Mm, mm, mm. And you hurt them in places you have no idea and you're trying to make up for it. That's wrong with most kids. Parents have said things that they, that they would have thought about they wouldn't have said. And the hurt that they do to them is those kids are having to get over that all the rest of their lives. Because of someone just lost it for the moment and said a few words. You think it doesn't have an effect? It does have an effect. Number two, getting off point. Miracles and great works do not guarantee a change of heart or a deeper abiding faith or get rid of unbelief. That's the first thing I know. It's like all these miracles, you would think, because I used to think, God, just pour out the miracles. God, you did miracles. People change. And I'm looking at this. No, they don't change. Not that God doesn't like doing miracles and that he doesn't want to bless his people. He does. But it doesn't change our heart in the process. We were, we sang the song, Nothing Else. We were at Sticky Teens and, and so we were singing, nothing else will do, I just want you. And so, you know, I'm just really singing it. And so the guy comes down and says, nothing else but pay my bills. Nothing else but heal my children. And nothing. I thought, God, do we do that? Do we say nothing else but in the same moment asking for a bunch of stuff? So I'll be honest, I was, God, just help us with the church, help us, got nothing else, but I'm thinking about all the stuff that needs to be done, and like, but in that moment, was he nothing else? Mm. No. No, he was nothing else, and, comma, and, comma, and, comma, 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 you know, it was a bunch of stuff with that, nothing else. And I was like, you know, then there's the point, God, I'm so sorry. Can I get to the point where I'm actually in a moment in a worship service? And it really is nothing else. I don't, I, don't, I don't have to ask you for anything. I just want to be in your presence. I don't want to be in your presence to get a word. Pastors, come on, let's be honest. I don't want to be in your presence so I can teach other people and they can think how great I am and, oh, that was prolific. I want to be in your presence just because I love you. Amen. I was listening to someone teach and he was saying that you go to heaven and you were all healed and all your bills were paid and your family's there and, and you had love there and everything was just great. Perfect utopia, but Jesus wasn't there. But you'd be comfortable being in heaven without him. And I, I mean, I've been processing this for like two weeks. Like, God, help me change my heart. How many really fall in love with Jesus? Because, God, there's areas in my life that know it's not there. 
I'm focusing on my kids, my family. We gotta be honest. You know what I'm saying? It's like, God, help me. Because I don't want to be there if you're not there. Amen. Sometimes we're looking for more of what he can do for us instead of just who he is. And if he did nothing else, would it be enough? If he never answered another prayer request, would you still think he's faithful? It's good. Mm. Hallelujah. There was a book. Um, Church of God, the Church of Christ, um, what's his name? Guy writes all the book. Writes all the book. He's talking about his daughter at the pool. <laughs> Max Lucado. Max Lucado. He wrote a book. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Max Lucado wrote a book, and in this book, his daughter falls into the pool, and they get her out. She kind of drowned. They get her out, and they bring her back. And he's like, praise God, praise God, praise God. And God said, if she had died, would you still praise me the same way? So let us be careful that it's not just about the stuff. You know what I mean? Because the most faithful people in the Bible should have been the children of Israel. They had more miracles than anybody has ever seen. <laughs> Great, astounding miracles. I mean, they got a cloud by day. They got a fire by night. All they got to do is go out and pick up their bread to eat. He brings the north wind and brings some quail. Water comes out of a rock for their, position, for, for, for their provision. And they were the most unfaithful. Let us not be care let us not be like them. And they're used for our example as our admonition. Let's see this in Hebrews 3. 1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus. Hallelujah. That's a word. Fix your thoughts Hallelujah. on Jesus. Whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. He was the faithful one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of the house of God was greater honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was a faithful servant, was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what had been spoken by God in the future. But Christ being faithful as a son over God's house, and we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence and our hope in which we glory. So, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in rebellion during your time of testing. Listen to this. The wilderness time was a time of testing. In the wilderness. I'm going to go a little different direction this quick and I'm like, I'll hurry up there after this. If you find yourself in a wilderness season... Your heart will determine how long you stay in it. Good. I graduated Bible college in, when I was 25, and I thought, I am going to be the next whoever. I got asked to be on a staff, a staff at a major ministry, and God said, no, your character is not formed right. I had to say no to the opportunity because I, God said no. And I went from preaching at a meeting with 4,000 people, prophesying, praying over people, thinking, this gift I got is great, to sitting for 14 years. I didn't teach. I didn't really do anything because God needed to work some things in my character. Because the gifts that God gives us are powerful, but if they're not motivated by love, they will hurt people. Amen, amen. The caution is when you're in the wilderness season, you're being tested, is to be formed so that you can stand in the position where God wants you to be. And so we can't want to get out of those things too early because God cares more about our character than our anointing and our calling and the gifts that he's given us. If we make it about that, it's about us and not about him. Amen. And if we do that, we end up hurting people. But if we really want to minister to people, we can only minister to people out of love. That's what 1 Corinthians 13 tells about. What? If you have the gift of prophecy and you do all this, but you have not love, what? You are clinging, you're just making a bunch of noise. So if love is not the motivation of your ministry, then you don't have a ministry. You have a self-exaltation of you. That is why Jesus is going to come to the end and say, I never knew you. God, I prophesied for you. I did this for you. He's going to be like, oh, you didn't do it for me. You did that for you. Because you wanted your name to be great yeah. instead of my name to be great. I don't know why I'm getting on this. I don't know 
Whatever it is God has you for, do not get from underneath what God is trying to perfect or perform in your life too quickly. And I don't care if it's 14 years, 17 years. God, do whatever you need to do so I can be whoever I'm supposed to be. Because I don't want it without you. 3-9. Well, your ancestors were tested and tried me. Though for 40 years they saw what I did. This, that is why I was angry with that generation and said their hearts are always going astray. And they have not known my ways. They knew his acts, but they didn't know his ways. So I declared an oath in my anger. They shall never enter my rest. Their prophetic word over their lives never came to pass because they never got their hearts right. I want you guys to get the import of that. They never walked in the fullness of their destiny because they never changed their hearts. Only two. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitful by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. And as just has been said today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in rebellion. Who were they who rebelled? Were not those Moses led out of Egypt? And whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear they would never enter his rest? Was it not those who disobeyed? So if we say that they were not able to enter in because of their unbelief, do not let unbelief keep you out. Number three, you and I are without excuse. We will be held responsible because greater light equals greater responsibility. Amen. You are so fortunate to live in a country that you can get a podcast, YouTube, five Christian channels, two Christian stations. Everybody has something that you can listen to with the word of God. Time is the great equalizer. People say, I don't have time. No, you don't make time. Let's be honest. We don't make time. We'll binge watch something on, on Netflix, but would you binge watch the word of God? I'm not saying something wrong with binge watching. Don't, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't, you know, I'm not saying something wrong with TV. I'm not saying that. But if that is the basis of your diet and it is not the word, you need to make a shift. Amen. And don't make, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, you're trying to, don't be performance mentality either because just doing it ain't not going to make it right. I'm going to read my word. I'm going to read my word. And you're reading it, but it's not unfruitful. To, it's not being fruitful to you. I'm going to pray, but I'm just praying because I know I need to pray. No, it's about relationship. Start with 20 minutes. Start with 15 minutes. Just start somewhere. I think we try to eat the whole, you know, whole um, elephant. Just take one bite at a time. Amen. I, I think, you know, then, then there's condemnation because you're trying to be like this other Christian. No, just be you and be at peace with being who you are. Don't try to perform to somebody else's standard of what, you, what they perceive as holiness. Find out what God has for you. Because it's a relationship. And every, you guys all been in relationships. Every relationship is not the same. And what I do with one person, I may not do with the other person. And that's my prerogative. I'm just saying, you know, it's the same with God. It's a relationship. And as we learn more of him and we're in relationship with him, it's just different. So let it be like that. Let him just gently teach you and show you. I think sometimes we're too in a hurry to get somewhere. And you're going nowhere. You're going to heaven. That's what you need to know. You're going to arrive on time if you got your heart right. You know what I mean? We're going to all get to the same place. Your reward is not my reward because it was based on what God told me to do. And God may not have told you to do that. So if you're trying to do what I did, you may be in trouble with God. Go do what he told you to do. I don't have to be faithful to what he's called me to do. And then a word of caution. If someone else tries to tell you what God told you, you tell them that God ain't told me I ain't doing that. I'm going to do what God told me. I'm grown enough to know what I need to do in God. Because people get in bondage. Well, mama them told me. Mama them didn't call you. I love mama and them, but they didn't call you. You're going to be in trouble with God if you don't obey God. Just saying, because there's so much bondage out there. Be free. That's somebody else's gift. Let them do it. Burn, baby, burn. I'm going to do. say over here what I'm supposed to be doing. You understand what I'm saying? Be at peace. Blue letter by Barclay says this. These cities did not attack Jesus. They did not drive him from their gates. They did not seek to crucify him because some cities kicked him out, remember? They simply disregarded him. Neglect can kill as much as persecution. These cities were so privileged. 
They had the privilege to talk to him. <laughs> if you guys go back to verse 19, he's talking about John the Baptist before we get to this verse. And it seems like, okay, God changed the subject. Whoa, to this. You're just talking about you and John the Baptist. Whoa, to this, right? He's going to tie this back. Why? They did not receive John the Baptist who came in the spirit of Elijah. They did not recognize Jesus, the Messiah, who came, and they did not submit to his authority. So Jesus demonstrates the importance of responsibility and stewardship. Why? Because everyone who has, more will be given. So have you seen God's grace personally? God's mercies are what? New every morning. So in our nation, in our cities, in our churches, we got a church on every corner. You don't like this one? Go find one that you can like and you can submit to and be in fellowship with. We believe in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the hope for the world. You need to find one and be accountable to one and be in one. As long as they preach in Jesus, go, you know what I mean? You need to find some place that you can dig down roots and become deeper. But we will have no excuse on the day of judgment if we do not repent and believe. If it was true of Capernaum, how much more is it true of us where the, we have broadcast of the gospel more than any other place? We will be without excuse. That's our warning. So let's finish with Joel 2, 11. And the Lord thunders at the head of his army. His forces are beyond numbers. The mighty is the army that obeys his command. The day of the Lord is great and dreadful. Who can endure it? Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rent your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for our God is gracious. He is compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending his calamity. Amen? Amen. So we're going to end with this song. And I don't know where you are. You know where you are. I know I had to, you know, do some, you know, as the old people say, I didn't do a little check up from the neck up. <laughs> God, where am I really? And if you've been praising God, but you've been thinking about all the stuff you need from him, I just want us to sing this last song and nothing else and really make it about him for that 30 seconds. Just focus nothing more on, on him and how good he is. God, I just want you. I want your presence. I want to be able to hear you. I want to experience you. We used to sing songs like he touched me, which is just about God's presence coming over us and touching us. And we were just happy enough just to feel his presence in the room. So as we just sing this song, I want you guys to just make it about him. Just make it about him. God, I don't need anything. I just want you. So let us stand and she's going to lead us through. When I've come 
myself and the more I'm around people I said I'm realizing that the true crux of Christianity is not how much money you have it's not who you say hi to it literally is how strong is your love walk for other people how strong it is and if you truly want to reach God's plan for your life your love walk must be impenetrable and I said, well, God, how do you quantify your love walk? And he said, Jerry, you have to love like Christ when they treat you like trash. You have to love them like Christ when they treat you like trash. And that is the found, that's, that's, that's the floor of where you start. Love them like Christ because Christ died for us. So you have to die for the people who would want to kill you. You have to turn your back and say, go ahead and slit my throat and cut my neck for the people who want to kill you. That's the crux of foundation of Christianity. And so this morning, don't worry about coming up. Don't worry about saying anything. Ask yourself, am I there yet? Just don't say, just ask yourself. Say, Lord, am I there yet? And you know if you're there yet before you ask it. And then you don't want you to ask the Lord, what must I do to get there? And he's going to simply say, you have to die. You have to die. But God, I'll lose myself. Yeah, that's the whole point of it. He said that unless a seed falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. And so today, let's just pray for ourselves. Let's just pray that right now you will make the choice to love like Christ when they treat you like trash. Because at that point you truly become like Christ. When you love like Christ. When you forgive like Christ. When you walk like Christ. So Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord for this weekend that we've had a three powerful services, Lord. We thank you Father God that we can begin to die more so that we can do more. What a paradox. We can die more to ourselves, die more to carnality so that, so that we can live more to Christ. As we die more, we'll do more with Operation Christmas Child. We do more with volunteering. We'll do more with serving. We'll do more with 
our family. We'll do more with those who we don't love. But we'll do more with those who irritate us. We'll do more with those who frustrate us. Lord, we'll do more with those who we have the opportunity to walk in unforgiveness towards. We'll pray for those who misuse us and abuse us. Because, Jesus, we want to be like you. Nothing else but you. Nothing else will do. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. We will do whatever it takes to die with you, Lord Jesus. We won't run. We won't deny you, Lord. We'll stand here and take on bullets. We'll take on swords. We want to live for you. But we first have to die with you. So, Heavenly Father, thank you for this weekend. Thank you for convicting us and showing us where we're wrong, bringing the light into our dark places. So as we leave this morning, we lift you high, we glorify, and we won't be the same when we leave. We'll leave here with this on our minds the whole week and let self-death towards you rule our whole week, Father. That we look at people a different way and that we're drawn to those who disgust us. We love those who hurt us and we die for those who want to kill us. And we forgive those who are forgettable. In your son's name we pray, Lord. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, y'all have a blessed week. We love y'all. Hug someone's neck. Give them a Holy Ghost high five. And you are allowed to linger at EOC. Hang out with somebody and, and just give them love. Amen.